at all. So I'm going to talk about headaches. And uh, when I think about headaches, I'm thinking about many, many different disorders. But let's, uh, let's begin with uh, Chiari. Uh, Chiari malformation is a uh, ectopic cerebellum where the cerebellum begins to push through the base of the skull, as you might see right here, and pushes on the brain stem and spinal cord. And if you cough or laugh or strain, this can cause increased headaches that can be fleeting, momentary, or can last minutes or even the whole day. And there's very often signs of uh, brainstem compression or cerebellar abnormality with clumsiness, gait changes, swallowing problems. And the treatment for a Chiari malformation is a suboccipital decompression. That's removing the base of the skull right here. And, and that works sometimes. Now, here's a patient that I'd operated on 10 years before. And uh, she had gone on and was running a, a medical, a large medical practice. And she returned with memory loss and headaches and this CT scan. And I thought, oh my goodness, I didn't do a good enough decompression 10 years ago. But I, I noticed on the CT scan that there was a tightness in the brain. And this prompted a, uh, an MRI uh, with a contrast, and we saw increased venous congestion around the pituitary gland and down the spine. And when we looked at the major draining sinuses, the big veins that drain the blood out of the brain, we saw no flow. They were thrombosed, as you can see right there. And when we did the MRV, here's the MR venogram, you see blood flow on the one side, on the left, and no flow on the right. That was a thrombosis. She had hypercoagulability and a thrombosis. We treated her with Lovenox, and within a month, she was back to normal again. No surgery necessary. This young lady from Canada had increasing headaches, as we often see. But then she developed leg weakness and urinary incontinence, and I thought, does she have um, a tethered cord syndrome? And, uh, but then she developed a personality change and memory loss, prompting this uh, CT scan. And you can see the uh, loss of blood flow through the straight sinus, the, the sinus rectus. And this, again, was a thrombosis. And within a couple of days, she's back to normal. A couple of days of anticoagulation with Lovenox. This 25-year-old woman from uh, South America was a missionary. She had severe global headaches, dystonic seizures, and then she developed a loss of consciousness. And again, we found this thrombosis. And uh, in two days of Lovenox, uh, she was out of the unit heading home. So I simply want to emphasize the importance of hypercoagulability which seems to be more common in EDS, and how this can affect uh, brain function. Now, this begs the question, how does the blood leave the brain? And normally, we think of the jugular vein, as shown below. And in the supine posture, lying down, most of the blood flow exits the cranium through the jugular veins. But when we're standing up, there's a great deal of blood flow around the spine, the perivertebral plexus. And so normal is on the left, but sometimes there's compression, as you see on the right, of the jugular vein by the posterior belly of the digastric muscle or the stellar hyoid ligament. So how common is this jugular vein stenosis? In a large series of CT angiograms, they found a venous compression in one-third, and in 18%, the venous compression was quite severe, as you see up here on the upper picture. And in 9%, we saw collaterals, uh, as uh, shown below, uh, collateral uh, venous circulation draining the brain. And here's a case where both jugular veins were compromised, and we see this massive circulation around the, the uh, vertebral, uh, around the spine. So if you raise the venous pressure, <clears throat> this can secondarily cause raised intracranial pressure. And so this is probably a common cause of pseudotumor cerebri, 
or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And uh, very briefly, uh, the treatment of this turns out to be weight loss or diamox, which decreases CSF production, or serial lumbar punctures, not a very good plan, uh, lumbopertineal or ventriculopertineal shunts, and, and, but more recently we're doing more stenting and anticoagulation. Let's talk about arterial headaches. Uh, this patient presented with a, a blindness in one eye, an ophthalmoplegia, the eye wasn't moving, and the eye was bulging out, and the other eye was normal. <clears throat> this was in a vascular EDS patient, and there was a carotid cavernous malformation, an arteriovenous malformation. Fortunately, not very common. This is more common. This patient had a suboccipital headache, headache in the back of the base of the skull, and uh, very often there may be some subtle neurological changes, or there could be a stroke. This patient had a dissection of the vertebral artery. There's no blood flow through that uh, vertebral artery shown on the left. It's, it's your left, but it's the radiologist's right. And that's a dissection due to the inner lining of the vessel breaking away from the vessel and occluding that artery. Okay, that's a dissection. This young lady from Canada had frequent uh, transient ischemic attacks, TIAs, and the arteriogram showed this anomalous blood flow. All the blood flow to the left of the brain came from the right side of the brain through this anomalous blood vessel. This young lady presented with the worst headache of her life. I thought it might be an aneurysm, but when we looked at the CT angiogram of the neck, we found a dissection of the left carotid artery, and she, she's getting no blood flow through the carotid. And then we looked at the other side, and she's getting no blood flow through either carotid artery, and it's amazing that she survived with no neurologic deficit. Now, uh, this is a severe hydrocephalus, water in the brain. Uh, we don't see this kind of hydrocephalus in the EDS patient population. But we do see pseudotumor or idiopathic intracranial hypertension and I mentioned this a moment ago. And this is usually men more than women, usually in the third and fourth decades. And they universally have headache uh, and they develop visual changes. There may be double vision, there may be a pulse synchronous tinnitus, a whooshing noise in the ear. If you do a lumbar puncture, the pressure should be above 20 in a normal person, or 25 if, if they're obese, 25 centimeters of water. Uh, and, or if you, better yet, do an intracranial pressure monitor, you'll see elevated pressures above 20 or 25. And so more and more of these patients now are receiving stenting. They undergo an angiogram. And if there's a occlusion of the uh, sinus, they may be a candidate for a stent to improve the venous flow out of the brain. And that helps a lot of these patients with pseudotumor cerebri. Now that's intracranial hypertension, increased pressure. But on the flip side, you can have a headache uh, due to low intracranial pressure. And this is due to a CSF leak uh, somewhere uh, in the central nervous system. And this, and this uh, leak is worse when you stand up, and it causes not only headache, but nausea, vomiting, anorexia, neck pain, dizziness, and there can be other neurologic changes as well. It can be quite difficult to diagnose, and it can be difficult to differentiate from a normal increased pressure headache. Uh, if you do a lumbar puncture, you'll see a pressure less than six centimeters of water lying down, but it's better to do an intracranial pressure monitor over the top of the skull. And once that monitor is in, if you stand the patient up, the pressure should drop down below negative seven centimeters, or uh, negative seven millimeters of mercury. So that's an intracranial hypotension syndrome. And if you get an MRI with contrast, you might see this venous congestion around the pituitary gland, 
Uh, you'll see thickening of the meninges. Uh, you may see loss of the space in front of the brainstem, but the pecomeningeal thickening is the main thing to look at. If you look in the spine, sometimes you see spinal fluid outside of the dura. Those white arrows point to the dura, and the red arrow points to CSF on the outside of the dura. And on the right side, you see a squiggly black line, and that's a venous varix, that's a, an engorged vein due to the low pressure system. So back to Chiari's again. Here you have a Chiari and a syrinx, syringomyelia. Are they causing the headache? Uh, if you look at large series of patients who've undergone a suboccipital decompression, 20 to 50% have a long-term failure. And the reason for many of these cases is ligamentous laxity. So uh, uh, Klee Camp looked at 45 revision decompressions for Chiari and found that more than 20% of them had untreated basal invagination or a craniocervical instability. And he stressed the importance of looking for instability with dynamic flexion extension films. Millerad in 2007 showed that almost 13% of his Chiari patients have a hereditary hypermobility syndrome. I think that percent is actually much higher. But it's very important to remember on the flip side that many EDS patients have Chiari-like symptoms but no Chiari malformation. So it's been recognized then for the last uh, two or three decades that this increased incidence of headache in the EDS population might be due to and as a consequence of a laxity of the ligaments between the cranium and the spine. And it's not surprising when you recognize that the major stabilizing structures between the cranium and the spine are ligamentous. Gohl, who's performed hundreds of craniospinal fusions, says that this ligamentous instability causes a micro trauma to the central nervous system, and that leads to decreased neuromuscular control, you know, more looseness of the neck, and this pathophysiology is worsened by uh, vitamin deficiencies and malnutrition and deconditioning, and these things happen commonly in the hereditary connective tissue disorders. So uh, again, uh, many have recognized uh, the, uh, uh, the presence of developmental coordination disorder and headaches and quadriparesis and clumsiness in many patients with EDS, uh, including uh, our own Sir Rodney, uh, uh, who published on this. And Van der Pape, who's speaking at this conference, has also shown uh, uh, reported on this case where the odontoid, the top of the spine right here, is pushing on the brainstem, and that mechanical deformation causes severe neurologic uh, problems. Doug Brockmeyer reported 100 patients and found that 20% of Chiari patients had to go back and get a craniospinal fusion because of the presence of a kyphotic clival axial angle that's this angle right here, or the presence of basal invagination. So when does uh, ligamentous laxity become pathological? Everyone with EDS has ligamentous laxity, but when does that become a surgical problem? In 2013, representatives from 17 hospitals and institutions got together and came up with a consensus that these three measurements were important to look at when you're looking at the craniocervical junction, and we'll briefly run through these. The clival axial angle is the angle between the back of the clivus and the back of the axis, and normally that angle is 150 degrees or more, and if it's less than 135, that's potentially pathological. So uh, his, this clival axial angle is very pathological, it's 105 degrees, and that causes a stretching and mechanical deformation of the brainstem. Now, the grab mapstone oaks measurement is that measurement from the dura to a line drawn between the basion, the base of the skull, and the posterior inferior C2, 
If that measurement's more than nine millimeters, there's a very high risk of ventral brainstem compression. That's pressure on the front of the brainstem causing mechanical deformation. So on the right side, you see that's abnormal. Harris looked at 400 normals and found that the distance between the basion and the odontoid was never more, or was never 12 millimeters or more. So if that distance is 12 millimeters, that is a, uh, that is craniocervical instability. Now, if you look at the normal flexion extension imaging, you'll see that the basion, the base of the skull, pivots over the top of the spine between flexion and extension. It should never translate. It should not slide back and forth. This patient, when they flex, the skull slides forward about eight millimeters, and when they extend, it slides backward. That is craniocervical instability, and that's pathological. This patient is clearly unstable. That Harris measurement is 15 millimeters. So it's very important to get dynamic imaging. This film on the left looks relatively normal. It's not really, but it looks, most radiologists would say it's okay. But the same patient in flexion shows a very clear evidence of basilar invagination, the odontoid pushing on the brainstem. Craniocervical instability causes headache. It's usually in the back of the head and then radiates over a part or all of the head. Uh, it's throbbing, shooting. It's worse with exertion, worse with uh, looking up uh, or, or turning. There's often truncal ataxia, hyperreflexia, weakness, clumsiness, nausea, imbalance, uh, memory and, uh, uh, issues. Treatment is realignment of the skull and the spine, reduction, reduction of deformity, fusion with bone, usually from the bone bank, and stabilization such as this uh, device here. And uh, I'll be hopefully uh, submitting my two and five year follow-up of patients with EDS with craniocervical fusions later this year. We're just waiting for some edits from other doctors. Uh, but we found improvement of the headache from an average of 8.4 to, uh, to 4.5. Headache wasn't gone, it was just substantially improved I think we're getting better results uh, these days. Now, the other genetic causes for headache, this is a HOXD3 homeotic transformation where the C1, the first cervical vertebrae, remains fused to the skull base. And that re often results in instability at C12 and cause headaches. This patient had a Chiari and a HOXD3, and uh, he was a trombone player. He couldn't generate enough wind anymore to blow the trombone. And in this case, I just did a decompression, and he did very well. He did not need a fusion. Uh, now, I've mentioned all of these radiological metrics. They're guidelines. They're not indications themselves for surgery. So surgery should only be done as a last resort if you have disabling pain with the appropriate symptoms, congruent neurological findings, and failed uh, non-operative treatment. Now, many headaches begin in the neck. They're cervicogenic. And at Johns Hopkins, uh, Don Long, the former chairman, noted that 25% of his patients, or of the patients who underwent Chiari surgery had continued headaches. And he stressed that many of these were the result of instability in the cervical spine, the neck. Uh, Sultikam showed that two thirds of the population have headaches. Usually in 50% they're misdiagnosed, but the ones with neck, with cervicogenic headaches, they were the ones with a greater quality of burden life, uh, 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 you know, greater pain uh, and a higher quality of life burden. So uh, C12 instability is, seems to be much more common in their connective tissue disorders. Halko found that 25% of his patients with vascular EDS had a C12 instability, and you can see the facet overlap here. And uh, now in other disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis, the problem is due to a transverse ligament, and it gives you this picture. That's incompetence of the transverse odontoid ligament. But in 
EDS, it's the alar ligament that's incompetent. And this is found, uh, seen here uh, on this image, where that, that's a normal alar on the left, on the right there's an incompetent ligament. And if we rotate the cervical spine in the CT scanner, there's an increased angulation between C1 and C2. And this classically causes four main symptoms, uh, syncope or presyncope black, blackouts, visual changes, uh, severe occipital pain radiating behind the eyes in the distribution of what's uh, an occipital neuralgia, and also uh, pain in the hands and legs, dysesthesias. And on exam, we see spasticity, hyperreflexia, and decreased sensation of pinprick. Uh, and here's the CT scan showing uh, the subluxation of C1 upon C2. And uh, there are other causes of, uh, uh, and, and other ways to demonstrate atlantoaxial instability. Um, but uh, the treatment is reduction and then fusion with uh, allograft bone. Uh, and stabilization with uh, screws and rods. And this has been very successful. Now there's a thing called a Kimmerley anomaly, a pontus posticus, which is calcification around the vertebral artery. And so when they turn their neck, this can cause a stretching and occlusion of the vertebral artery. It's usually asymptomatic, but in some cases can cause dizziness, drop attacks, paresthesias, even a vertebral artery dissection, as I've discussed earlier. Now, it's very important to do dynamic imaging in the cervical spine. This patient on the left looked perfectly normal on the MRI. On the extension view, though, you can see all of a sudden there's stenosis, compression of the spinal cord. It's a dynamic film. So this patient, a young lady, presented with headaches, a blurred vision, a weakness of the deltoids, difficulty walking, and I sent her out for this uh, dynamic imaging showing the subluxation and compression of the spinal cord. We performed a simple discectomy and uh, stabilization, and uh, most of her symptoms immediately uh, abated. So uh, uh, Ed Benchel at Cleveland Clinic showed that if there's hyperangulation of the spine, that causes a stretching of the spinal cord and he calls it a form, called it a form of tethering, the sagittal bowstring effect. So you can see this on dynamic imaging, a stretching of the spinal cord. And uh, this has been uh, discussed at length by Punjabi and White and their criteria for spinal instability. Now nerves can also be functioning, but they can be hypersensitized. And this is neurogenic pain. The nerve is still working, but it's very painful. And the emblematic of this is the occipital neuralgia. This is the dorsal component of the second cervical nerve, and it causes severe pain over the back of the head, radiating behind the eyes. This nerve comes out between C1 and C2, is often involved with atlantoaxial subluxation. And, but the neurologic exam of that nerve might be completely normal, but the pain is excruciating. The diagnosis is by a nerve block, and by palpation, and the treatment is, uh, if you don't have to stabilize the C12 segment, the treatment is either decompressing the nerve or cutting the nerve. I've had uh, migraine headaches are three times more common in women than men in EDS. And uh, some of these migraines are due to a patent foramen ovale. In this patient, uh, we ordered a transesophageal echo with bubble technique and we demonstrated bubbles passing through the foramen of valley, and this was the cause of her migraine headaches. There can be remote cause of headache. This tumor in the neck, uh, an ependymoma, not hard to see how that could cause a headache, but the tumor on the right side, this large ependymoma, when I removed that, the patient's headache went away. So uh, headaches can be due to tethering. I think that tumor caused the tethering of the headache. And you can see on this patient, at the T2, the second thoracic level, the cord is tethered posteriorly. And every time they bent their head forward, they stretched the spinal cord, and that caused tethering and headache. <clears throat> 
But we also see tethering in the lumbar spine from the uh, a thickened phylum. And Petra Klinge uh, will be speaking about this or has. And this causes headache in about half of cases. The diagnosis of tethered cord syndrome is uh, moderately severe low back pain, leg weakness, numbness, and bowel and bladder problems, and congruent urodynamic uh, findings. Dr. Metakaitis gave a superb lecture on TMJ uh, dysfunction. That causes headache in the back of the head, and, uh, and that has to be looked at. And almost every patient with EDS has TMJ dysfunction. We see disorders of immunity, and Ann Maitland spoke about mast cell activation syndrome, very common in EDS. These patients have headache and brain fog. And we also see an increased incidence of immune problems. We see antibodies to pathogens that, we, that occur in normal days, such as streptococcal infections. So the PANDAS, the pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with strep infection, is due to streptococcal infections. It occurs in adults, too. That can be treated with uh, uh, plasmapheresis, IVIG. We see neurobichettes in the Middle Eastern population, an inflammatory disorder. Paraneoplastic limbic encephalopathy, uh, uh, emblematic of which is the anti D aspartate receptor encephalitis, which are antibodies to tumors or pathogens that then attack parts of the brain. And uh, here you can see the inflammation of the medial temporal lobe. Uh, so that's an encephalitis picture. So in conclusion, uh, it's Headaches are a useful measure of disability and suffering, but they're highly variable and they're nonspecific. These diagnoses are not always obvious or intuitive, and they have to be considered and looked for. Awareness of the many comorbid conditions of EDS is important to establish the origin of the headache. And remember that ligamentous laxity is an important feature in many, an important cause in many of the uh, conditions that generate headache. I'd like to acknowledge my co-workers, Claire Frankamano, Miles Kobe, my new colleague, Robert Rosenbaum, Peter Rowe, Rodney Graham, Alan Pasinki, Petra Klinge, Ed Benzel, Mark Luciano, Mark Alexander, uh, Jonah Murdoch, Jessica Adcock, Kelly Tuckman, Zhuyan Wang, Michael Healy, and David Gordon for their uh, help in dealing with these cases. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.